Red light means it's on, right? <laughs> Good afternoon. I am certainly happy to be here. I have been looking forward to this. And I hope that uh, we can work together here to make this a very enjoyable experience for you. Um, uh, as Professor Redvine said, I have done a few things that um, I feel have been an aid and uh, have helped to enhance uh, teacher education and have helped to uh, enhance parents being more involved in their children's lives as they go through school. Um, I have three adult children myself. I have six grandchildren, uh, five grandgirls, one grandboy. He is 16. He is the oldest, thank goodness. <laughs> and uh, the grandgirls are just sort of stair steps all the way 13 back down to age nine. And they keep me hopping, okay? Um, there are a lot of things that I do to keep myself involved in their lives because right now, as we live in this technological world, they are always looking down. And I'm sure you know why they are looking down. They are looking at their iPods or their iPads, okay? So I have to do things, really, to keep myself connected with them, okay? Some of the things I've done uh, to keep them connected, last summer I uh, raised some chickens at my house. I went to Zealand and um, I bought a dozen eggs. I brought them home. I got one of the little um, incubators from school, and I let those eggs um, be under the light for, I think it was 21 days or something like that. They started cracking, and the chickens started pecking themselves out of that shell, and I had all of my grandchildren, they were focused. So these are some of the things I've done. I've raised rabbits. This is done as to God truth, okay? To keep them involved in our lives, because like I say, there's so much technology now that we really have to do things to uh, keep our children and grandchildren involved in our lives. But um, that is not why I'm here today. I'm here today to try to connect with you, to give you some ideas of some of the things I have done to uh, uh, keep parents involved uh, in their children's lives. I have a little handout that I would like to give to each of you. Um, you may do this in groups if you would like. Years ago, I was at a seminar at Calvin College, and um, during the course of that, I mean, the room was just full of people, okay, and near the end of the seminar, they passed out these sheets, okay? So please take one and see if you can figure out, this is a sentence, okay? It is a long, stretched out sentence, all right? I will tell you that much. So if you can just take a couple there and pass them around. There might be too many there. And just see if you can figure it out, okay? Um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I did not figure it out when I was at the seminar at Calvin. I did not get it figured out. But there was one person that got it figured out. And I felt like, oh my goodness, so that's what that is, huh? Does everyone have one? You can talk together, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, let's see if you can figure it out. Uh, this is the top here. Okay, this is the top. I know there are no words on it. This is the top. Okay. Got to make sure all of you, yeah, you have it right. Yes, that's correct. Yep. Mm hmm. Yep, you have it. Okay, you need to turn. So take a few minutes, see if you can figure it out. It is a sentence, okay? Got it, this table got it, okay? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Look at it from a different angle. Do you see how that's written now? Okay, and that's sort of what I want you to do today. Have your mind open so you can sort of look at things in a different direction, okay, in a different angle. You know, we as educators, you know, just don't want to have t uh, tunnel vision, do we? You know, we want to be able to engage people. We want to be able to uh, listen to other people's ideas. And, uh, you know, and, and then we can uh, probably educate in a much better way. So great. If you would like to keep those, you, you can, okay? It would be fine. Now, this is what I sort of want to talk about today. Encouraging and utilizing parental involvement. Um, 
And here's a little subtopic. Learn to communicate effectively with your students, whoever they are. Learn to communicate effectively with your students, whoever they are. I'm hoping as you hear uh, some of my experiences today uh, that it will trigger your thinking because sometimes when we graduate from college, we might think that, oh, I'm going to be teaching at this beautiful high school or you know, with all of this technology, but it might not necessarily be like that. Uh, it wasn't like that for me when I graduated. I graduated after uh, my children were raised. Okay, I started uh, college and then I got married and then I finished my education, okay. And I thought that I probably would be in the classroom, but it wasn't like that, okay. I was asked to be the director of a program, which, you know, I learned to enjoy, but I had no idea that it would turn out to be like that for me. But everyone, like I said, would like to be in a school with modern technology, okay? But know your passion. What is your passion, you know, prospective teachers? What is your passion? Teaching has to be your passion because it's got to come from the heart. Because you may be in a school with old technology. It may not work, okay? Um, one of my relatives is a music teacher, okay? And she graduated from college, Michigan State, years ago. She's retired now. And for years, she did not have a classroom. She had to push a piano up and down the hallway. Well, she didn't expect that when she was nearing the end of her uh, uh, college years. She thought she'd have a classroom, you know, where, you know, piano and everything else that she needed. But it wasn't like that. So for years, she had to, as I said, push a piano and push the piano into the rooms. Well. I'm not trying to discourage any one of you, but just be prepared, okay? That's why I'm saying teaching has to be your passion, and I hope, certainly hope it is. Now, when I took the position of uh, directing a mentoring program for students at Baxter Community Center, it was, you know, I don't know if any of you uh, know where Baxter Community Center is. Anybody? Okay. It's in the heart of Grand Rapids, okay? And I, I did not know anything about the inner city of Grand Rapids, okay? I've never lived there before. And I did not know or understand the culture of the inner city. But that's where I wound up, having to direct a mentoring program, okay? So I embraced it, okay? Uh, I, I, I knew that uh, I was going to have to involve parents. If I was going to make that program work, I would definitely have to involve parents. Once parents trust you, then their children will trust you. But until you build that element of trust, it's not gonna work as well as it would if you would take the time to uh, get to know their parents. That's why I had to look at it from a different angle. Because as I said, that was not my expectation. I had to spend time in the neighborhood. I had to invite people in. I had to uh, call people, work with them, in order to really understand the lifestyle. Mostly it was single moms, single parents, okay? And, you know, the family that I grew up in, you know, I had uh, mom and a dad, grandparents, aunts, uncles, the whole nine yards. So I didn't even know what it was like for a single mom to have to go to work, take the child to school, go to the grocery store, fix the car, you know, if, if a tire blew out, she had to do it all. So I spent time learning the lifestyle of a single mom, okay? Trying to make that connection with them so they would trust me with their students. Um, it took time, okay? It, it took lots of time. And I also trained mentors when I was at Baxter, okay? I had to set up a program, an entire program. I trained 20 mentors at uh, the Dominican Center. And I encourage you today to, as you, you're on your journey, okay, going through college, to get a mentor, someone that can walk alongside you, uh, someone who can encourage you on your journey, because it, it is not easy, you know, the four years of college you're going through, and I'm sure, you know, you know that. 
But if you have someone you can talk to, it could be a teacher, could be your parent, you know, could be a minister or whoever, a friend. But uh, uh, that mentor is, is plays a very, very important role in the life of a young person. Okay, because these students were, as I said, uh, from all uh, basically single parent homes. Okay, and there are so many needs. Just so many needs. There, there are needs at home. There are needs at school. Uh, you know, they need to know how to uh, make wise decisions, how to make wise choices. And once they can sit down and talk to a mentor, uh, a friend, you know, that can help them to walk through that. And they can start to uh, build that element of trust. It builds their self-esteem because some of them their self-esteem is so low, they don't even trust themselves. So this is some of what I had to do. After I trained the mentors, um, I started working on the program to develop it. Uh, I, I started uh, uh, getting my mentors from friends that I knew, could have been um, people from church or uh, college people, a family you can go into. You got to start with people that you know, people that you trust, that you're going to put uh, 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 with another a young person. So that's what I did. And uh, my program met at Baxter once each week. Uh, it is similar to but different from the Big Brother Big Sister program. You may have heard of Big Brother Big Sister. But it was different in that we met each week. Uh, I brought everybody together and I had uh, a little curriculum plan for them, and it gave the mentor and the student time to uh, talk together, time to find out how did your day go, you know, what what is it I can do to help you, you know, and you know it's not always the mentor helping the student. The student can help the mentor too. It is a learning experience, and and uh, both people learn from each other. Um, some of the ways that I involved parents. Uh, along with the mentors, we had refreshments. I would call parents, ask them to, hey, could you set up a table, you know? That kept that parent coming. It kept that parent involved in that child's life. And they had the opportunity to actually see, you know, and witness what goes on when we meet. I didn't have to tell them. They had a chance to see it for themselves. And actually, they enjoyed it, you know, because it's not like you're at home and you're telling the child, oh, you know, go clean up your room. You know, you, you're out, you're together, you know, you might be sharing a meal together and just spending time together, you know. So to me, the best way to spell love is T-I-M-E, time with the student. It is priceless. Um, I do want to play a little tape now because some of the things that we did, um, and, and, you know, on this table over here, I, I hope that you can get a chance to look at some of these pictures over here. Uh, before you leave, but one of the greater things that we did during the course of that program was a CD. Um, I would bring in professors. I, uh, uh, Professor Vita Tucker, who used to teach here at uh, Grand Rapids Community College at that time, I brought her in to teach poetry to the students. Um, poetry really reaches the heart of students. And they, the students really found that out when she started teaching it because the way she taught it, it was so simple for them to grasp. Uh, she taught them how to use their own surroundings, the things that are in their household that they saw every day. She used those things. She had them to write it down, use that, and, uh, and they learned to write poetry from that. We went on to make a CD. It's called The Gift of Words Rooted in Poetry. And uh, it, it, it meant so much to the students. You know, we had the Grand Rapids Press to come, and they took pictures of them. And on, on the night that we released it, we released it at Shula Books and Music. And this, you, I wish you could have seen, at least I still remember, the look on the students' faces when all of the people gathered around to hear what they had written. You know, they had written this themselves. Of course, it's written in their own vernacular, but still, it's their work. They were proud of it. And we could see how it built confidence in the students and it helped to build their self-esteem. So what I'm talking about is how to keep parents involved 
in uh, students' lives. There are lots of ways to do that, but this is just some of the ways that I did it. And I can tell you, uh, I, I know now, I talked to one of the mothers actually this morning, her son uh, came into the program when he was in the sixth grade. And now he is probably middle 20s, he has graduated from Michigan State, and he's a counselor at uh, one of the institutions here in the city. And, you know, just to see an outcome like that, you know, it's very re rewarding, especially when you know that you've spent time there uh, uh, with those students. Um, in the course of uh, working with students uh, from single parent homes, it, 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 it just makes you feel really good to see them grow up and to see them go on to college and, and graduate and really become what I'm sure they had hoped to become. There was another student who came into the program when he was in the sixth grade. He had straight A's when he left Henry. It, then it was called Henry. Now I think the name has been changed to um, Martin Luther King. But uh, he came into the program as a straight A student. He went to middle school, he got into basketball, and his grades started to plummet. Um, he dropped out of school in high, uh, when he reached high school, and um, he, I think he uh, had a child, and then later on, <clears throat> he wound up in a night program. Actually, he wound up in my husband's math class. But you know what? He, gra <clears throat> he graduated. He did. He uh, got a top score on the ACT test, because he was always a smart student, okay? But he just sort of, when he got into that, <clears throat> that basketball, it just took him by surprise, I think, because all the students were just really cheering him on until he just forgot his, you know, his, his studies. But as I said, he graduated and he became the valedictorian of that GED class. And he has a wonderful job now. Every once in a great while we'll see him. But still he reached his goal, all right? So just because they uh, sometimes might have low self-esteem or coming through you know, school and uh, maybe growing up in a single parent home, it doesn't mean that they won't be able to reach their full potential. It does not mean that. All they need is somebody to care, somebody to show some love, somebody to channel into their life and give them some guidance and some direction and get connected. Um, if you really want to communicate yourself with your students, start learning to communicate now, okay, effectively. Start making sure you know uh, that you really want to be a teacher, okay? I honor teachers, I really do. Uh, I think that is one of the greatest professions that it could be, is to be a teacher. I just honor them, especially these two sitting over here, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna play this little tape now. The first, th th this is some of the portrait that the students wrote uh, in the program at Baxter. Uh, you can play the first two and then uh, play number 11. everything. I am the sunset that sets in the dark. I am the beautiful shiny moon that you see at night. I am the beautiful forest that everyone loves to see. I am a big beautiful waterfall that everyone loves to feel. I am a young black girl with a good personality. I am as sweet as a strawberry cheesecake can be. I am the teacher Sherrod. I am everything. Waiting. I am waiting, waiting for something to happen, waiting for someone to arrive. I wait, I wait, I wait. As I wait, I think. I think about my family. I think about my life. I think, I think, I think. As I think, I wonder. I wonder about what I will be in life. I wonder about what I will do. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. While I wonder, I wish. 
I wish I was done waiting. I am. Recipe of me. A little of that and a little of this. A little of Greg and a little of Chris. A little of that and a little of this. A little candy, a little pop. A little clothes and shoes to shop. A little of that and a little of this. A little TV when I'm alone. A little talking on the phone. A little of that and a little of this. A little family, a little friends. A little love that never ends. A little of that and a little of this. Pour it in a pot and what do you get? Voila, me. Ebony. I am. <laughs> that CD did so much for those students. They were so proud of it. And uh, on the table here, uh, this is a picture here of my son. He helped to produce that CD, okay? Uh, you can sort of pass that around if you want to see it. Um, it, it really inspired them uh, to go on, and after that, believe it or not, they got better grades in school, you know, because they felt a connection. They felt that someone cared about them. Their parents were involved. Their parents really uh, channeled into that and just really became a part of it. And to see how they just worked so hard after they did that CD, they wanted to sell it. They sold it for $10. They, 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 it, was a fun, it became a fundraiser, you know. And uh, we went to many different places with the CD. And they, they really just, hey, they wanted to do another one. But I tell you, it did a lot for me, too. But I just want to tell you this. Much has been written about how much influence parents have in their children's lives and development. You may hear sometimes that the contribution that parents make, you know, in their children's life doesn't mean anything, and that kids only want to, you know, be influenced by their peers. Well, that's not true, because research has shown that even though we have iPads, iPods, video games, you know, all of this technology, parents, grandparents, loved ones, caregivers, still are the people who have the greatest influence on young people. It may not seem like it, but it is. You, it, it usually comes out much later. But I also have uh, a couple of questions that I would like to ask you. Um, what is, I mean, how, how, when did you know you wanted to be a teacher? Any of you? When did you first know that you wanted to be a teacher? I'm assuming everybody in here is going into the teaching field, is that right? No? No? Who, who might be going into the field of teaching? Okay, that's enough hands. That's good. When did you first know? Right, right here. When did you first know that you wanted to be a teacher? Uh-huh. That's good. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yeah, that is great. I mean, you really have to just sort of go somewhere and try to figure that thing out, don't you? Because just to graduate from high school and go off to college, not really knowing what you want to do, could be wasting some money. Who else had their hand up? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And you also have, uh, you know, that patience, I think, to stick with it because, you know, when you're around students, you can just sort of tell if they're comprehending, you know, and, and if you have the patience to stick with it, you know, that also lets you know. Somebody back here had a hand up. No? Okay. Yeah. Well, that is great uh, because that means a lot. I mean, to, to know your passion, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's got to come from the heart. Because like I mentioned earlier, you may not be teaching, say, in Forest Hills or wherever. You know what I mean? Where you, we, we consider that's where all the money is, you know what I mean? But you may not be there. And just in case you're not, it doesn't matter where you are. If teaching is your passion, you don't care. You just, all you want to do is impart knowledge into another, uh, into a child. That is the most important thing that you want to do. Um, when I was at Baxter, of course, they didn't have technology like I thought they would have had. I had to use whatever was there to try to make this thing work. And you know what? It worked, okay? Uh, the, the, the way I know that it did, the students come back to me now saying, you know, they remember the mentoring program. They, they know what it did for them. Some of them are still connected with their mentors. You know what I mean? Because sometimes it gets to be a lifelong thing, all right? You don't, you don't just stop it you know, because the program is over. Now, here are some ways that you can involve parents, okay? Uh, once you get into your uh, profession and you're trying to figure this thing out, you want to make sure that you can be the best possible teacher possible or whatever you're doing, okay, if you're not going into the teaching profession. Just ask them, you know what I mean? Ask them to get involved. People are waiting to be asked, you know what I mean? Invite them to school activities, parent-teacher conferences. Uh, you can invite them to work in the classroom. There are many ways. Sometimes people think, oh, gee, you know, it's so easy in elementary, but when I got to middle school, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think I want to, I don't think my child wants me to be around anymore. Well, that's you saying that. That child always wants that. They may not... It may not seem like they do, but they do. Always ask parents, okay? Um, once the parents are there, they get a chance to see for themselves the challenges that their child is going through. They get to learn things. They get to see things for themselves. They don't always have to wait for their child to come home and tell them, okay, what went on at school. Many things going at school, okay? Make parents feel like they're part of the team. How do you go about making another individual feel like they're part of the team? You engage them. If you see maybe a parent sitting off, a little bit quiet and all, walk over and ask them a question, okay? Draw them into the conversation. Talk to them. Don't just wait, you know, like for them to put their hand up, okay? Many folk won't put their hand up, okay? You have to use your skills that you've learned to engage them. Ask them a question. You may already know the answer to the question, but ask it anyway. That way you get them engaged. You involve them. And that way they, they, uh, they, they can feel like they're part of the team. Another way, uh, designate a space. You know, th this is like when you, you know, graduate and you're teaching. Designate a space for parents at the school. So when they come in, they know that there's a room that they can go to, hang up their coat, the purse down, they feel at home in the school, okay? I think that uh, when my children were coming through, I involved myself. I had to, okay? I, I wanted to be there. Uh, in elementary, uh, I was asked to be uh, chairman of the uh, membership committee. I got to know everybody, and oh, I enjoyed that so much. You know, I mean, my children were there, and I wanted to be there with them. Okay, so I, like I said, I learned everybody. I was a part of it. Uh, I went to all of the conferences. I was there for uh, all of the little parties, you know, Valentine, Halloween party, Christmas party. I wanted to be there. I wanted to channel in, and I wanted to be a part of my child's education. I didn't want to just leave it up to the teacher to teach my child, okay? I wanted to play that part too, not only at home, but at school. And I think that, at least I do feel like that, if you do that, I think your child feels, you know, a sense of safety, you know, at school when they see parents. Uh, I, I think they feel uh, it helps to build their self-esteem, okay? They learn better. They get better grades, okay? 
when they, when they see family. And I, I just think that teachers need help. It's not up to the teacher to do all of the teaching. Okay, we, we must play a part. Here's another way. Send a list home. Send a list home by students, okay? Ask for some things, you know. Uh, would, would you mind uh, baking some cookies or something for uh, the Halloween party coming up? What is that doing? Engaging the parent, okay? Uh, ask them, uh, is, is it possible, you know, you feel you could um, uh, come up and uh, set up a table for some refreshments? Whatever you think of to get that parent involved, okay? It could be. Could be working parents. If they're working parents, there are always things after school that parents can do. Basketball games, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, selling tickets, sitting by tables. So many ways to involve that parent to keep them involved in, that, uh, in, in the child's life. I guess I know because I've been there. I've done these things, okay? Now, this one is kind of sensitive here, okay? Don't ever judge parents on the way they look, okay? Uh, it's easy to do that, but try to always stay away from that. Uh, everybody's not gonna look like us, are they? Everybody won't always look like you. Yeah. Some people don't have what you have, uh, so don't ever uh, do that. Uh, you know, somebody could walk in the door, they're looking tattered or something, you know, we, it's easy to judge, isn't it? You know, it's, it's the easiest thing for us to do is, is to judge someone. I know because I've done it myself, and I'm sensitive to that. And I know that, uh, you know, I don't want to do that. But the first thing we look at when we see somebody is their face, uh, their clothes, or whatever. So work hard at that. Here's a little story. Um, how many of you have heard of Dr. Benjamin Carson? the world-renowned neurosurgeon. You know, he's been to Grand Rapids many times. He's the one that separated the conjoined twins uh, years ago. Uh, I uh, took my students to see him at Fountain Street Church years ago. And I've read most of his books. Um, he, told, he told a story once. He was on, he had flown into some city to do uh, an operation and he, I took the elevator up, and he had on, you know, just scrubs, you know, those green clothes, you know, that you see maybe the orderlies wear. So he got off the elevator, and he walked up to the nurse's station. And before they even asked him his name, they just said, oh, the elderlies are in that room over there. <laughs> so then he told them, I'm Dr. Benjamin Carson. It's like, <gasps> they were shocked. Now, she judged him on what? What he had on, right? And I'm sure that was a learning experience for her. You know, hopefully it was. <laughs> but anyway, that's one reason why we are to never ever uh, judge people by maybe what they have on or how they look or whatever. But we can be, really make some huge mistakes. Um, so just make sure that we keep parents engaged. It is very important for students to do that, okay? And you know, work hard at different ways to do that. You always, you can't always reach the same person the same way, okay? What, what you use to reach one person, you won't be able to use that to reach another, okay? We as parents can be very sensitive in that area, okay? So study people, learn to understand them, and uh, be open to different ways of doing things. Uh, I want to um, pass out now a little group activity to you. I hope that you can get into a little closer. Uh, to do that, you can work on it in groups, uh, if it's enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, work on it together and then choose uh, a person at your table to uh, report out. And we'll see if we can't come up with some strategies here, some that I haven't mentioned, some different strategies.
Okay, which table would like to go first? Oh, I love volunteers. I love volunteers. That way you don't have to volunteer someone. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to, I want this to, uh, everybody to be able to hear you, so I'm going to let you hold the mic, okay? And you, uh, read the question first and then. So, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, it says, list a few developmental assets and the role you feel those assets will play in equipping young people to handle the pressures of daily living, make wise choices, and find meaning and fulfillment in life. So, me and my group, um, we discussed that family time is really important because um, you just need to have that support of family members, especially in little kids you need that confidence and they need to feel that you are confident in them whenever they do anything. But then on the other side, um, I, I'm taking a Math 210 class um, and I had to do a writing assignment in that class and I read an article about self-esteem and that talked about that children who grew up in the 70s and 80s, they, um, they were given phony compliments, as in like, if they would do something and it wasn't good as it should be, they were still told, oh, it's a great thing, or you're doing great, when they should have been told, no, you need to work harder. So I think a sense of reality should always be there, not too harsh, like don't kick them out of the house when they're five, but you know, have that sense of reality so they know what they need to work on, but also provide support and love. Thank you. Okay, next table. <laughs> oh, good, wonderful. Okay, our table came up with kind of like a list of things you could do for each bullet um, for pressures of daily living. Um, we came up with like a daily or week weekly chore list and you can involve your parents in it, maybe make it more fun than just go clean your room or something. Um, and that kind of makes a connection with the parent. Um, for making wise choices, we um, said like a discipline system because um, it is hard to teach kids how to do the right thing, but I mean, if they do something wrong, they do need to you know, have consequences because that's how the real life is. Um, and then for uh, finding meaningful and fulfillment in life, um, teaching core values. We learned in class the other day that the schools are doing monthly um, core values like trustworthiness and maybe the parent could figure out what's going on at school and then incorporate that at home as well. Uh, we kind of came up with three bullet points for <clears throat> each uh, question. Uh, for the developmental assets, we discussed the importance of a loving family. Um, while recognizing that all uh, loving families come in all shapes and sizes. And so, um, and as far as the things that they provide to children, uh, a sense of security, support, confidence, um, you know, all the things that a loving family can, can provide a child. Um, also, the need for basic needs and, and financial security to be met. Um, you know, as we've learned in some of our education classes, you know, if a, if a kid's hungry uh, at school, he's going to have a hard time learning. We have a, we have a hierarchy of needs, and so um, the need to feel safe, comfortable, uh, all those things, reassured. Um, and then also, um, a third bullet point for this question would be a mentor, somebody to uh, be there to give advice, uh, to guide them, someone that c you can go to and, and try to learn from their mistakes, someone a little older, a little wiser who's been around the block a couple times, um, a non-judgmental sounding board, someone to talk to who's not going to pass judgment. Um, as far as a few strategies for getting parents involved, are we going, one, or if we go there too? Okay. Uh, you know, ask them. As you said, uh, a lot of parents are waiting to to do something, would love to do something if they're just asked. Um, create opportunities for them to do something. Um, you know, parents have various skill sets, and so, you know, if uh, maybe uh, one parent can help with band, another parent can help coach cheerleading, another parent can, you know, help with the basketball team, uh, 
come in and read with the kids. You know, all the parents have uh, different uh, skill sets, and we just need to create opportunities for them to, to help. And also flexible times. Uh, parents are hectic, have hectic lives, and so uh, some of them can come in during the day because they work at night. Some can come in at night and do things. So um, being flexible when, with the times that you ask parents to do things to help will allow more of them to, to do so. Did anyone else do anything with the uh, question at the bottom, um, which was uh, a few strategies to encourage parents? And what, would anyone else like to talk on that or say something? Um, we just kind of took examples of um, stuff that we did, like they had the daddy-daughter dance kind of things to get those involved. And then career day um, is always nice to get like your family in there and stuff like that. And then um, she said that she had, someone said that they had their moms come in for Mother's Day and they wrote them a card or something and they had to read it to their moms and fun stuff like that. How many of you can remember when you were leaving elementary and um, going into middle school, <laughs> how did you feel with your parents still, you know, if they came around? How, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have to let you talk <laughs> because... <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know. I guess I experienced, like, my mom was at every single party or function, school function she could, uh, like, possibly be at all through elementary school. So I guess I had enough with it by the time I got to uh, middle school, maybe. But, uh, yeah. So that's about that. Who else? Who else remembers how they felt when they were in middle school? You know, you wanted to be with your peers then. You know, you were top dogs, okay? And you were done with the elementary thing, you know, where moms, you know, the room mother, who remember the term room mother? <laughs> I was that too. <laughs> you know, but I understand that, okay? Uh, you sort of want to pull away a little bit and you, you want your space. Um, but still, you know, um, uh, you can go through that separa separation anxiety, right? <laughs> you have to give your parents a chance to, you know, get through that period because they really do still want to be there but they also want you to start developing that little sense you know of independence because that's very important so if we can just find common ground you know what i mean find uh and, and know our boundaries okay then everything usually will work out okay uh, my husband and i were band parents i mean we did it all and we so enjoyed it you know I hate to say this, but one time my husband even went to one of my our children's college classes and just sat in the back. <laughs> we loved it so much. But you know, I mean, it, it was a great journey, okay? And now the thing of it is, once you uh, do that, you got some good memories to look back on. You know what I mean? You have a full life because I tell you, it could be awfully different if you didn't, you know, if you weren't there. You, you know what I mean? So um, I just hope that. Um, I have said something that, you know, have really inspired you to really know that parents play a great role in their children's lives, okay? It, it, it's extremely important. So think of many, think of ways, think of stra different strategies to, to, to make it happen, okay? I mean, I had to do that. I mean, it, it's work, but it's good work, okay? It, it's rewarding work, and, and when you look back, who said, gee, boy, I'm so glad I had a chance to, you know, impart something into a young person's life. Now, I do want to leave a little time for a question and answer, okay? If any of you guys got any questions, that doesn't mean I got the answer to everything, but I'll give it a shot, my best shot, okay? So ask me a question, and I need, and now I need that volunteer again, okay? <laughs> ask some questions. How do you get a parent involved that doesn't want to be involved? The question is, how do you get a parent to be involved that really does not want to be involved? Boy, that's a tough one. I had that. I have had that. Um, you have to persevere, and you have to be determined. 
because you above all know how important it is. That parent may not know the importance right then because they may be frustrated by other situations at home or whatever, you know, other children, work or whatever, but still you know that you want that parent involved in that child's life. Okay, let's see, how do we do that? Make a phone call, talk to them, uh, invite them to coffee or something like that, uh, send a note home, set up a special meeting and just talk to them and let them know, you know, I, I know, you know, your life is very full, you probably have full schedule, but if you have a little window of time, maybe on a whatever day of the week, you know, and just, just to come, you know, you don't have to be here for the whole day or a half day, just maybe 30 minutes. So try that and see, you know, it could work, but you just have to keep thinking, keep calling, don't stop. That's the thing, just persevere and keep working with them. Great. Mm -hmm. So hers first, okay. How do you deal with parents that are divorced and they fight when they're together? And like, how does that, it affects children, obviously, so. That is a great question. Uh, oh Lord, I had that so much when I was dealing with the program. I would invite, you know, the parents in just parent night. I had that, just parent night. And uh, I brought in speakers to talk on that subject and they would give them, you know, certain ideas of, 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 of what to do. Uh, I, I won't forget, there was a time when I was running a meeting and um, one of the dads was talking about how when the children are with him, everything is just fine. But then when they go to be with the mom, oh, all of the bad language, you know, the bad eating habits, you know, what happened when they would be with her. Well, I heard it. And you still got to be neutral, you know, you don't take sides, okay? So you just have to encourage, you know, when that child is with you, the time that's spent with that child, make it good, you know what I mean? It's not quantity, it's quality. Spend quality time with them, okay, when you have, this is just about all you can do. Because that, that very situation does happen, it happens all the time. Because the child is here one week, they're the next week, you know, and, and they hear different things, okay? Whatever values or whatever uh, uh, morals go on in this house is different in another house. Maybe when uh, they're with the mom, maybe they sit down to the table and they say the table grace before they eat. Maybe when they're with the dad, they don't do that. You know, it's like get a piece of pizza and go wherever, you know. So it is very difficult, and the child is the one that's the beneficiary of whatever, you know, uh, happens in that situation. But my encouragement to parents uh, is whenever they're with you, make it good. Make the time quality time. And, and, and that's lasting, okay? Anybody else? Do you ever have children that like resent their parents and don't want their parents involved and how do you respond and get them to change their minds? I guess, of, of all of the questions I've heard so far, it seems like, <laughs> it seems like I had that situation each time because in the program, there, every single culture was represented, okay? So I have had that where, you know, the child don't like the parents, they're frustrated, just can't get along. It's not a lot sometimes you can do, you know? The only thing that I did was when they were in the program, is to try uh, to encourage them, try to do things to build their self-esteem, try to give them little jobs so they could feel like they were, they, you know, their self-worth was being noticed. You know what I mean? To build their confidence. You know, because you can't, you can't go over the parent's head, you know, and, and just take over. You can't do that. All you can do is be a support. That's, that's about as much as you can do. And just like I say, the time that's spent with them, just try to let it be quality time. Show them that you love them. Show them that you care, you know, and, and, and just being there for them. You, you could, you know, uh, talk to the parents if, if you can uh, get them to come, you know, and let them know how you see the child reacting, you know, and see if there are other areas 
that that parent could channel into to try to make the situation better at home. You, know, you could do that. Because it, it is very difficult sometimes in different homes. You know, everybody got different morals and different values, you know, in their home. And uh, so you just have to just do the very best you can when that child is under your care. Okay? Other question? Sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. Anyway, we'd like to thank Mrs. Reynolds for coming in this afternoon and, and giving her insights. I certainly appreciate her being here. Um, one thing I'd like to add to what she said is that it would be helpful if, as teachers, we would develop our own cultural competency. I heard the word culture being mentioned quite a bit. And, you know, as Mrs. Reynolds pointed out, recognize that not everybody is going to look like you. Not everybody is going to look like me. And just because you do look like somebody else doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to handle that individual. So keep that in mind. And sometimes, as teachers, we have to call upon each other other to find out well you know get some 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 input well you know I'm, I'm having this difficulty maybe you can give me some insight if you have a, a parent who doesn't speak English uh, well for example you might have to need a translator you may need to go to someone who knows more about that culture and ask questions that show that you are trying to learn not that you're being offensive or that you're being um, um, condescending but that you really are trying to find out what is the best way to approach this particular parent so that you can get the help that you need. So thank you very much for coming. We have enjoyed this. We've gotten some good information. There's one other thing I want to point out to you, and that is over here on the table, there are some teacher education uh, um, newsletters that pertain to the Teacher of Tomorrow Scholarship. If you have not, if you are able, if you have a 2.8 GPA and better, and you are able to um, apply for the Teacher of Tomorrow Scholarship. There's some information here that you'll want to look at, and here's also a Teacher of Tomorrow Scholarship application. If you need more, I can get those for you. But please check that out, and if you can apply for the Teacher of Tomorrow Scholarship, we are encouraging you to do so because there is money there, and that will certainly help you with your tuition and books and everything next year. So again, thank you very much. I have um, the uh, certificates of attendance for you, and have a good weekend.